I hope this doesn't uh, mess up the mystique of me being a, an awesome YouTuber <laughs> and that I am very much uh, coasting off of my ability to write. I've been looking forward to this, so I'm really glad that you made it and I'm going to try my best not to uh, fanboy out. Howdy folks, this is Hedgepod, a podcast about how our mass media reinforces the cultural hegemony of the ruling class. I'm Jack, my pronouns are they and them. I'm also okay with he and him. I'm Nova, my pronouns are he and him. I'm Adina, my pronouns are she, they. I'm Soren, my pronouns are he, him. And we've got a very, very special guest for you today. Uh, this is Feek the Signifier from FD Signifier on, on YouTube. Uh, he does Black Media Breakdown, uh, video essays uh, on... Um, all kinds of different issues. A lot issues. of stuff. A lot of stuff. <laughs> a lot of stuff. I'm trying to think of a, a way to do it. But yeah, without without further ado, here this is Feek the Six Fire. We're, we're incredibly thrilled to have you on the show. Yeah, I'm excited. This is only my second podcast that I've done since becoming a YouTuber. This is my first one I've done since uh, becoming like important. So I'm nervous because now I have like expectations. Uh, <laughs> well, we and, and, uh, you know, reputation and all that. Well, we're we're glad to have you here, and uh, and most of the, most of the episodes here, we we start off by talking about cultural hegemony being a component of Marxist philosophy. Uh, so no, I'm so, sorry, and I use he him. I use he him pronouns. I'm sorry. He, he him. him. Yeah. He him all right. Cool. Uh, yeah, we're 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 leftists here, uh, so we have a lot of radical takes. So keep that in mind. The radical takes like that: uh, if you have to make children chant every morning about how great your country is, uh, it's probably not that great of a country. So uh, something to keep in mind uh, when when we, the hosts specifically here, are making our takes on on things that we we are doing it from a leftist lens. Um, so what we've been doing on this show is uh, up until today, have we've been watching different pieces of entertainment media we started out on season one watching sitcoms and then we uh we, we continued that season two did some specials watched office space together uh did a few other things and now we're on to a season about um animation so we've been watching let's see we did my little pony and we watched an episode of ruby so this time we're changing up the format a little bit we've got we've got feek here to help us uh he, he actually gave us some really good feedback uh on our show and uh, we were like wait we got to do this this is this is going to be a lot more engaging and uh i think that it's going to be a really cool way to do it so what we've done is we've we've watched uh avatar the last airbender we watched book three episode two the headband uh it originally aired september 28th 2007 and what we've done is uh, taking down a couple of points uh, about what we uh, what we noticed. So we're going to try to highlight some of the hegemony in the episode that we saw. Got a couple content warnings for y'all before we continue. We talk about fascism, sexism, indoctrination of kids, child labor, talk about colonization, um, war. So beware of those things before we continue. Water. Earth. Fire. Air. Long ago, the four nations lived together in harmony. Then, everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Nova, do you want to give us a, a quick breakdown of what the what the whole episode was about in general? All right, yeah, I can do that. So, um, at this point in the story, uh, Aang started learning. Uh, he learns water bending in the first season and earth bending in the second season. And now he's in the Fire Nation. He's trying to learn fire bending, and uh, there's also a, a rebellion that's kind of going on against uh, the Fire Nation and their you know efforts to kind of conquer the world there. Um, so they're in the Fire Nation now. They're trying. He's trying to find a fire bending teacher, uh, and then they've also got to try and like blend into uh, the Fire Nation. And so they're trying to kind of like fit in. Uh, okay. And what's also, basically behind enemy lines? They also think the Avatar is dead right now. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. End of season two. I think they 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 set it up so that he's dead. Um, and you've got uh, Zuko, who's like the son of the Fire Lord. Uh, who'd been pursuing him since season one, uh, and uh, his uncle Iroh, who's uh, kind of been um, helping him, but also helping the Avatar a little bit here and mm. there. Um, and he's been, uh, Uncle Iroh has been jailed for that. Uh, Zuko's trying to deal with that and uh, trying to process the like larger role that his 
uh, sister and his father want for him. So full disclosure, I I I didn't watch. I haven't watched the show up to this point. I, I I've been told by everyone that it's like the greatest animated show ever, and uh, that I need to watch it and all this stuff. So I I actually am up to like halfway through book two. So. Got some pretty cool spoilers <laughs> from this one, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, whoops. <laughs> so just to our uh, our listeners might be aware of that uh, before moving on. But the first thing that stood out to me was that like w- when we we I'm, I'm gonna forget all the characters' names here, but when we first see them pop over the they, they there's like a bunch of puffins on top of one of the characters' heads and. He's like, we're in enemy territory. These are enemy Zaka. birds. Yeah, Zaka. So he's like, we're in enemy territory, so these are enemy birds. And I know it was, like, supposed to be a joke and stuff, but it's kind of weird that we, like, our, our our concept of political borders and stuff is so, you know, deeply ingrained that we <laughs> we, we literally view the, the animals and the livestock as being, you know, those of the enemy when they're in, uh, you know, another part of the world. It's like, come on. They don't have any idea whatsoever about these borders. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, to piggyback off that, I, what I got from the episode as the biggest takeaway for me kind of comes from that as well is I think we're, as the viewer, supposed to interrogate the concept of how we view the difference between like warring nations and warring people. Mm. The fact that we spent so much time with the children of a fascist state mm. to see that they're still very much children, mm-hmm. you know, and the puffins are still very much puffins. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So it's like, we're supposed to, and I think that it, not, as you said it, I realized that immediately kind of maybe lends itself to that theme of maybe the absurdity of, of, uh, maybe nationalism. I don't know. I, yeah. I, I don't have the full thing. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so oh, yeah, they, they definitely are, um, trying to portray that this is, not good, I, I, I believe, um, which is kind of why I think Sokka is the one who says it, because he's normally the comic relief, so it's like, look how silly Sokka's being. He's like, oh, the Puffins are enemies, ooh, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. So so right on, after after that, we're introduced with a, uh, uh, a scene where they kind of transition, and uh, they have to disguise themselves, and get uh, Aang ends up get, wearing a school uniform, it's caught in the street, they end up going into the into the, he actually attends the school uh, for a day there. Oh, is this a new mind ready for molding? That's right. Let the molding begin. Wait a minute. You're not from the Fire Nation. Clearly, you're from the colonies. It's so interesting to see this nation that's presented as like this highly fascist sort of authoritarian regime. Uh, but there's a lot of things in it that are kind of, uh, kind of reminiscent of the school, the way that I remember it growing up. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> there, well, there, yeah. Funny story. <laughs> well, I mean, I like there's a reason for that. Yeah. yeah. So, so they're they're hyper disciplinarian, authoritarian, you know, sort of teacher and everything that that was there. They talked about the the Aang wearing the wearing the 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 garb and everything and acting out of turn. She she called him mannerless colony slob. And we don't wear head coverings indoors. Um, I have a scar. It's really embarrassing. Very well. What is your name? Or should we just call you mannerless colony slob? <laughs> just slob is fine. Yeah, and I, I was just like, wow, like I know it's a, a kids show and stuff, but it, but then it also, you know, I grew up in Oklahoma. It kind of reminded me of the way that they they taught us about native reservation schools. You know, mm. like they they mm-hmm. sort of were trying to, uh, you know, it, you know, uh, educate and, and tame the savages. What what civilize. have you? You know, civilize yeah. people. So. Yeah. They would use that sort of rhetoric and that sort of language um, when they're talking about anybody that's that acts in out of step with the whole, you know, imperialist colonizer mentality. White, white decorum. Yeah. yeah. 
Good. Yeah, and it's interesting. Uh, something that I thought was interesting about that part too, where the you know the teachers you know says he's from the Fire Nation colonies and is talking down to him. It shows you that you know not only is the Fire Nation like it's not just at war; it's actively imperialist and it's colonizing the rest of the world and has these colonies all over the place. But on top of that people in the imperial core look down on the colonies and on the people from the colonies, you know, because they're not, uh, I guess, you know, urbane enough to be up to date on the customs and traditions and fashions and everything of uh, the imperial core there. Good morning, class. Recite the Fire Nation Oath. My life I gave to my country. With my hands I fight for fire, Lord, fire, Lord, Lord and our forefathers, forefathers. With my mind I seek ways to better my country. And with my feet, fire vendors, fire, Lord. Does anybody else have children? Am I the only Jack? Person? I got, I got one. Yeah, yeah I have two. Okay. two I have cats and a dog. <laughs> cool. uh, also, I, also, I have myself. It's still very awesome. <laughs> I was asking because when, when you mentioned school earlier, and, and so I, I have two black sons. I've talked about on many an occasion. And so when you think about that level of discipline and mm -hmm. the indoctrination that happens in schools, uh, that is like you said, your experience growing up, but no, that's still going on. A yeah. lot. Like you yeah. have to be very intentional to avoid that. Um, and, and, and in doing so, it's a gamble because like, you know, the school indoctrinates you for a reason because you need to manifest those habits when yeah. school is over, you know, or be ostracized and other by the, you know, the greater society. So um, I have a question real quick for y'all Americans. <laughs> do you do you the children in school at the start of the school day? Is do you have like the pledge allegiance thing? Is that a thing down there? And it's still a thing. It, it's still very much Ooh. a thing. Uh, my my kids go to a pretty progressive school. It's a public school, but they they most of the teachers are on board with saying like you don't have to say this. You know they they let them know wow. they don't have to say it, but they still not do where it. we're okay. from. Yeah, when I was we, a kid that's growing not a up, thing up here. yeah, we had to say the pledge of allegiance every single morning, uh, and. And, and as an added bonus, when I was a kid in, in rural Oklahoma, we went to a, uh, every Monday, we went to a all-school sort of gathering in the gym uh, where, you know, we all stood up and sang My Country, Tis of Thee together. And, you know, it was, <laughs> it, it was next level stuff. It was, it was Fire and, Nation. And then yeah. there was a moment of silent prayer for mm -hmm. our fallen troops. Oh, yeah. Just, uh, I was homeschooled yeah. by religious fundamentalists, and uh, <laughs> I had a Pledge of Allegiance every morning to the U.S. flag and a Pledge of Allegiance every morning to the Christian flag. Is there a Christian flag? I, I was going to say. Yeah, there, there is, is a Christian is. flag. Wow. Oh, yeah. I'm Googling no, that. I know Athena's <laughs> seen it. Yeah, <laughs> I've seen it, too. We, seen it. We've seen it. We, we're, we're in, uh, I was raised Baptist. We were went to the... Yep. Got a church camp and all that. We saluted the Christian yep. flag and all that. So we had. I, the, I, <laughs> okay, really quickly, in all seriousness, the Christian flag looks awesome. <laughs> Wait, did you just Google it's it? It's a really cool looking flag. The, the, the things that I learned from you, Pete. <laughs> the, the, the white flag with the with the blue. Is it the one with the blue yeah, and the cross this on is, it? Yeah. I'm, I, this is a dope design. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. yeah, it's got a lot of meaning to it, too. Yeah. The, uh, uh, the white is like the. You know, you're washed clean of your sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. The red there, I think, is on the of the cross is for the blood. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's actually like know. okay, that that part of Chris, Christian iconography is actually so metal, like just like so much blood, <laughs> so much blood. Yeah, it, I, it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. There is so yeah, much uh, blood. The to blue it. is uh, the waters of baptism. I, I just that I remember like being in church and they would be singing uh, being washed with the blood of the lamb and I was just always like this is weird like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a child sitting there going this is am I the only one who thinks this is weird blah 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 since it's obviously hilarious to mock our national oath we'll begin with a pop quiz on our great march of civilization. Oh. 
and that's yeah. an interesting thing to bring up too, and that kind of ties back into the show because it, you know, the the kids and the, there's a lot of kids in the Fire Nation school in the episode who are you know interested in dancing. They're you know friendly to outsiders. They don't have that kind of xenophobia in them yet, you know. And it's because as kids, we're not like that. You know, as kids, like, yeah. I remember, you know, going to church as a kid and being like, hey, this stuff doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Mm. You know, that's an experience yeah. a lot of people have had. And sometimes it gets beat out of you, and sometimes it doesn't. And it's what, you know, kind of sparks greater change. The moment of curiosity that each kid had when Aang stands up to correctly answer a history question that mm. clashes with the uh what's the one I'm looking for with the with the bleached history of mm -hmm. the fascist state they are in they all got you guys kind of remember what i'm talking yeah, about yeah they like, had like a, a oh yeah like, how beat the wind nation or whatever mm -hmm. and ang's like well it was a surprise attack and all the kids are like whoa outsider question one what year did fire lord sozin battle the air nation army kuzon is that a trick question the Air Nomads didn't have a formal military. Sozin defeated them by ambush. Well, I don't know how you could possibly know more than our national history book. Unless you were there a hundred years ago. I'll just write down my best guess. It, 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 this, this was Footloose. Mm -hmm. am I, am I, did I age myself? Oh, oh yeah, no, I saw <laughs> yeah. it. Okay, good. Right. <laughs> this was well, Footloose. Well, they had the redo version recently, so you're fine. Yeah, this was Footloose <laughs> for kids. Yeah, they redid yeah, it. Googling that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, uh, yeah, it's something. It's a thing. Uh, but, but yeah, I, they, when anybody that questions the overarching cultural narrative and the 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 hegemonic history that's presented in the classroom is just immediately like outsider. You know, like wh well, wh what? Is somebody presenting a piece, an angle on this event that's different than what we've been told our whole lives? Uh, how can this be? Well, this is something that I, I wanted to make sure that I brought up. Because um, uh, I, I have my book here. Um, I made sure to have it. Uh, it's called How Fascism Works from uh, Jason Stanley. Um, and it, it's a really good book. I, I wanted to make sure that I plugged it. Um, be, and it goes through like all of the the pillars of fascism um and it's it's a really good easy quick read um but the thing that he makes sure to point out and it's very important and this is where school comes into play in these things is the mythic past of mm. fascism is arguably one of the strongest bedrocks if if you have that mystic past that um whitewashing the whole um make our country great again um, we, we, we didn't actually commit atrocities. Um, we were li liberating people, all that kind of stuff. Um, it is, it is very important to fascism. Um, so in school, if you have anyone who's questioning the narrative, they are dangerous mm -hmm. because a, one of the, like, fascism is very strong, but it's also fragile in that if you tug that string, it'll just, it'll just all unravel. Right. Yeah. I remember uh, right shortly after <clears throat> after George Floyd, uh, when Dave Chappelle did his, I, I don't, you can't even really call it a stand up thing. It was basically a memorial uh, when it co we were at the height of COVID. I believe it was in this special. I, I might be mistaken, but uh, there was some mention of Ma "Make America Great Again," and and it was just kind of like we're ma great again, great for who? You know, like great for this who? great for who? You know, it's not been great for a lot a lot of people in america so who where most what are we trying to get back to yeah most most yeah. people yeah. So, the mythic the mythology of like fascism requires mythology yeah um, and and but the mythology has to be real you know that's where the religion comes in mm -hmm. that's where the you know ronald reagan as the the you know quintessential american president um, I guess maybe Eisenhower before him, you know, and, and then what we think about, you know, Hamilton, <laughs> when they did a yeah. video, you know what I'm saying? Like there's, and it's, and it's sad because as a person who likes stories and myths, I'm just like, oh, this is an I awesome know. thing. Yeah, yeah, same. I feel that oh, so hard. It's so hard. So bad. Yeah. 
Yeah, and then you realize what it's contributing to when you you're in this constant state of cognitive dissonance of yeah. like. So I, I grew up Muslim, um, or or half Muslim, half Nation of Islam. N O Y. Does N O Y ring a bit of a bell, Louis Farrakhan? No, I, I don't. Sorry, a little bit. Okay, because I grew it's up in Chicago. Probably, so. Okay, I'm also from Chicago, so you yeah you know the deal. Well, then. okay, so since you're actually from Chicago, <laughs> I'm from Naperville. <laughs> oh, cool. Really I count as Chicago. I mean, well, now I don't know. Bolingbroke is different, but that we're we're, we're starting a side conversation now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, so people don't know. So so Mount, how, how how much time you got me to go on this tangent? You're you're oh, good. Go you're good. Go, go for it. it. So, um, Mount, let's start with Malcolm X, mm -hmm. um, which I know you're probably more familiar with. So Malcolm X was not. Uh, a traditional Sunni or Shiite uh, Muslim did not practice uh, Islam in the way that we think Islam exists for the most part. He was part of the NOI, the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. The Nation of Islam, and I'm going to get beat up by, for this if, if any of my former peers listen to this, is essentially like very cult to Jace. Um, uh, think Church of Latter Day Saints, think mm -hmm. Mormons, think uh, that's all I can think of out, out, off the top of my head. Where they, yeah. where you take the defined elements of a more traditional Abrahamic religion, and you kind of repurpose them for a slightly less, for slightly more nefarious, slightly yeah. less, uh, more slightly more cryptic religious movement. And so that was what uh, uh, Malcolm X belonged to. Mm. And then when he, and, and then the belief systems, just like if you've ever, I don't know, uh, the, the, you've, you've probably seen like even the South Park uh, story about like the Mormons yeah. uh, beliefs that involve aliens and whatnot. Yep. The nation of Islam's beliefs are just as wild where there was a, 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 sci a scientist from Africa who invented white people in the, in the Caucasus mountains. Mm. Um, <laughs> It gets wild. Hey. <laughs> look it up. Look it up. Is that um, Yacoub? Yacoub, yes. Yes, there you go. So it, it, it is, and it's wild stuff. And I, I say like to say, so Malcolm X eventually, the, the, you know, left the Nation of Islam, which is partially what may have led to him getting murdered because the, the rumors are why the, the, my favorite conspiracy theory is that the NOI partnered with the FBI to have him killed mm. because Malcolm, when he came back from his pilgrimage to Mecca, and convert it to a more uh, traditional Islam mm. also started skewing significantly left, mm. became very socialist. And that was the most dangerous thing at the time. Um, so he, he was he was killed not long after that. But I, I say all this to say, having grown up in the NOI and around the NOI, hearing people tell me the story of Yakub and giving mm. them squinty eyes like what are you talking about <laughs> what do you mean an ancient scientist grew white people in a lab in the mountains mm. that doesn't yeah. make sense but you have to have the now that's an amazing anime plot right? <laughs> it's, yes yeah. not gonna yeah. lie <laughs> i would watch that yeah that's yeah. an amazing anime plot but in terms of like building a cultural zeitgeist around yeah that's a problem mm -hmm. so yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting. So you you talk about you know re being raised in a in a, uh, in religious uh, you know sort of a, you know immersion and stuff. So I, th there's a point later on in the series uh, in the episode where they they start talking about uh, you know Ang wants to throw me a, a a dance party. So he's <laughs> he's already been in trouble for cutting up in the in the band. He gets a he he plays in the school band and he's just like moving his feet. And the the teacher's kind of like, "What are you doing?" You know, he's like, "I'm just, you know, just moving my moving my feet around." Who's on? I know, I'm a terrible Sungi hornist. No, child, that hullabaloo going on with your feet is that a nervous disorder? I was just dancing. You do dances here in the homeland, right? Not really, no. Dancing is not conducive to a proper learning environment. Young people must have rigid discipline and order. They, they're like, we don't do that here. 
You know, this is a young people need to have rigid discipline yeah. and order. Is the yeah. quote I haven't read. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Young people need to have rigid discipline and order. Uh, but but that reminded me of an anecdote from my childhood, and that where I, I mentioned a few times earlier, I was raised in a Baptist church, and I don't know if this is still part of the Baptist covenant to this day, but we were not allowed to dance, uh, not only in the church, but the, any anybody that was part of the Southern Baptist, uh, you know, covenant wasn't allowed to dance because it was. I, I don't know. We were allowed to sway while we were singing songs in the church, but not not dance there was a there was like a full measurement of how far your foot lifted up off of the ground before it was considered dancing uh and we actually there was a whole like schism about it and stuff several churches split up because of this they they were like we're going to go and form our own church uh where we can dance because the dreaded church split <laughs> well compare that to like gospel it's just such a stark dichotomy to me you have you have sex like baptism where it's like so well, puritanical and harsh well, and not like... just that but then you have like church of christ um and you you can't you can only sing with your voice you cannot use instruments mm -hmm. and then... but then and then on the other hand there are people there's like other sects where it's like no our, our like religion is like a joyful like expressive yeah. Yeah. uh thing and it's like where did this like schism come from i, I don't know yeah. how you could read psalms and, and 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 still believe that there's no singing dancing or musical instruments like in in christianity like if you if you're the most pious sectarian and read that those books of the bible i don't know how you can interpret it any other way to be honest so it's it's well, definitely <laughs> it's funny you bring that up because um once again, I have this book here called How Fascism Works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, there is that a chapter? I think it's part of Unreality. I'm not sure, but it's in there. It's a, just a suspension of, of, of seeing a, an alternate reality that fits your worldview and creating it. This, what you know what this reminds me of, though? This yeah. sort of tangent about, like, fascist control of art and artistic expression. It reminds me of like modern music theory and what is considered mm -hmm. like correct, mm -hmm. correct mm -hmm. music being like the I don't know I guess classical or baroque yeah. tradition of like uh, white, white people, German white people, yeah, yeah white exactly. Western European, uh, exactly. Yeah. Whereas if you look at like like ethnomusicology or like musical tradition from other parts of the world where like dance is extremely central to music they kind of go together you can't really divorce the two and yet that's not what's considered like like i don't know jack you have the degree in music for sure uh yeah there's there's just a ton of whitewashing whenever it comes to uh music history like it's just something that we uh in in and and much like much like ang in the in the episode anytime somebody stands up and asks like wait a second there's been you know there's music from Asia, there's music from Africa, there's music that was played, you know, in the in in Russia and in, in, in the Ottoman Empire and stuff that is that India that just didn't even resemble this sort of stuff. Why is this the only thing that we're studying? And they get these strange looks, you know, from the professors and stuff like, well, well, this is the foundation of our music, you know, the music we listen to the today. Canon. Yeah, this is the canon. Yeah, this is the musical canon. And. Uh, so yeah, and that's and there's very much it's a very active and, and still currently ongoing part of music history. I, I think they're trying to branch out a little bit more, and there's there's classes of what you call quote unquote world music, which is basically <laughs> any music that was not Western European white music. Um, right. So there there's some effort that's being made, I think, but it's it's not enough. It's not enough. It's and it's not just music. I was an English teacher for ten years, and I'm in the South. Um, so he also had like the moment of silence after the, 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 uh, uh, uh I'm about to say the Statue of Liberty. What the hell do we say at the beginning? <laughs> Pledge. Pledge, Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance, where it was a moment of quiet contemplation. I was so confused by that mm. because as, uh, coming from the North, I'll be like, what are we contemplating right now? Can I start my <laughs> lesson? You guys are going to mm -hmm. come in, you know, whatever. But, uh, so the way it is where I, where I, where I was teaching is you start it with um, just ninth grade literature, whatever mm -hmm. that is, which is mostly Western European with maybe some a handful of world things sprinkled in. Then you went to world literature, which was still a very Anglo-centric. 
and then you went to American literature, mm. and then when you're a senior and you're really about that life, you got British literature. Mm. <laughs> wow. And, <laughs> and you, I'm laughing as I think about it. it, it it's, <laughs> it's a laughable, it's a laughable concept. I mean, yeah, we, we've gone through this, like anyone who's gotten a college education too can like, uh, you know, can point pinpoint so many different elements of cultural hegemony that have just been, you know, I, I and not really in, in like the, you know, the, the liberals are trying to brainwash you sort of thing. I mean, but just in the, in the idea that all of our institutions are products of this colonial imperialist sort of mindset, this, this dogma that we have subscribed to, you know, as a, as a nation, our, our, our education system follows that. Um, well, I mean, the whole thing of like being brainwashed by the liberal, I mean, the, the thing that will radicalize you and whatnot is just having an open mind and heart and willingness to learn. Um, and another thing too is learning like what actually happened in history is also really radicalizing because when someone mm -hmm. comes around and says, you know, make America great again or make the Fire Nation great again, then you're like, ah, wait, when, when was that? When, when? Yeah. Yeah, for it. Um, are, do we want to talk about um, the reform school that were the coal mines? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Right. Nonetheless, you are forewarned. If he acts up one more time, I'll have him sent to reform school, by which I mean the coal mines. And that's, that's yeah. you know, not great work for uh, physically. That's not great work for anybody, but especially not for children. Mm. Yeah. The idea that, like, y you're going to get healed or you're going to get uh, corrected or somehow by doing all this backbreaking manual labor like okay you're you're acting out of line so we've got to and they even call it reform school like it's like re, like it's supposed to be some sort of rehabilitation program <laughs> like that's that's a yeah. lot like the like wilderness uh you know exposure uh well, troubled teen camps that they mm -hmm. have it's it's the literal like work will set you free bullshit mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. It's also very clearly a, a punishment, which to me seems strange because it's like, okay, so clearly we need to send you to reform school to reform your mindset, which, you know, we feel is not nationalist enough. So we're going to send you to this, this horrible punishing labor camp, and that will teach you to love your nation more. <laughs> Well, about, I mean, it will because you'll they'll break your spirits and. That's what they hope. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. And it's also just pu punitive. It's a mm -hmm. uh, calling it reform school, but having it be a coal mine is is uh, uh, 1984 adjacent. You know, the Ministry mm -hmm. of Peace. Yeah. Starts yeah, yeah. war. Double speak. Double speak. You know. Yeah. Double mm -hmm. right. And and then it just kind of it in it ingrains. It, it reflects the, uh, I guess, pure, is it puritanical is what I want to use, where we think punishing people is a way to bring yes. them closer to the norms that we yeah. expect. Yes. It's, yeah. Instead of just yeah. having good norms yeah. that don't yeah. alienate people and make them want to rebel. Right? 100%, you know? yeah. Who Although, fear? if we look at the history, of course, of like labor, like labor organizing and labor rights, I feel like at some point, you know, if you're, if you're sending a, 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 an amount of your populace to work in horrible conditions, they are going to, at some point, be like, hey, you know what? Actually, this is bullshit, yeah. um, and we hate you, and uh, we're going to organize <laughs> right. if possible. Yeah, you can't you can't punish every single member. Like it requires there to be some degree of separation. Because if everybody had to go to the coal mine, then they'd be like, "Screw this! I don't yeah. wanna, I don't want to live in this sort of situation. These, these people don't care for me. They're sending me to the coal mine." Like, but you, when you do it to one person, it's kind of like, "Yeah, they got in trouble." So yeah. you know those little troublemakers. Their fault. Their fault. It's, yeah, it's their fault. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was just watching Philadelphia for. This next video, I had never seen it. Are you all familiar? It's the Tom Hanks, Denzel Washington. Yeah, I've seen it before. Yeah, and um, I would the 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 uh, argument of the defending company or whatever that fired him 
was that he deserved AIDS for behaving yeah. uh, recklessly. And then you look at the history of, you know, of how the AIDS epidemic was allowed to just move unencumbered mm -hmm. for, you know, several decades. That was like the general attitude. Well, they are the yeah. ones doing the things that we say not to do. So this is their literal yeah. divine punishment. Yep. Um, and, and that resonates, I guess, in a lot of fascist things. I guess that's a really nice tool in the, in the fascist toolkit. Mm -hmm. We saw it when, I mean, I remember Pat Robertson saying that about Hurricane Katrina. Like, this is the oh. modern-day Sodom and Gomorrah. They're taking all these wayward souls and wiping them out. You know, God is doing it to, to punish, uh, you know, the people of New Orleans, I guess. I don't know what he was getting. I guess New Orleans was bad. I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I guess that was his point <laughs> he was trying to make. <laughs> like, but I remember him saying that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's been, it's been ongoing and it's, uh, it's definitely something to be aware of and, and to not be taken by it. You know, it's, you know, I have friends and family who, who, you know, buy into this rhetoric very quickly. And it's like, you know, there's not, it's not us versus them. It's us versus us. Like we're all us, you know, like right. there is no them, you know, it's, it's just us. This is all we have. So we got to take care of each other. Um, the thing I think to remember about hegemony is that it's not just it's not just useful for fascists. It works because people, a lot of people, are desire that. Mm. If that it makes sense. It, it, it simplifies the world. It simplifies yes. a complex world. Yeah. And so people are willing to go with it if it can explain, you know, the horrible things they have to persevere right. through. On a daily basis, yeah. Uh, it, it's it's uh, kind of that's exactly why like conspiracy uh, theories work really well. Mm -hmm. yeah. The simplification uh, make it make helps people understand things and um, understand it, and even if it's a far fetched thing, it helps them to to come to grips it's with that it. That feeling I guess. of clarity. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I think that the episode. At, at, at large was was i mean all of the stuff that we're commenting on here i feel like the showrunners were probably like hey we we need to come up with the with an idea of a fascist regime so it wasn't like that they were trying to normalize all this behavior right like we should give oh, the no. showrunners some credit well, uh that, that's, yeah. that's uh, honestly if it wasn't for uh avatar being such an influential animated series uh I, you know, I wanted to be sure that we had it in the animation season because of its importance, but it's one of those, I would have had it for our next season where we're going to be doing shows that are, you know, actually pretty based and have a good... Accidentally uh, based. <laughs> yeah, ideological message to them, uh, because Avatar tends to do that pretty well mm. uh, mm -hmm. for the most part. Uh, they tend to have a pretty good yeah. message, and... Uh, this is more, I mean, when you think about it, this episode's a little more an examination of our own cultural hegemony than it is like a propagation of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is, I, it cannot be an accident that the Fire Lord Oath is so similar to our Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that somebody right. there who was making it realized that and it was intentional. Right. Yeah, overall, yeah. I really enjoyed watching the show. I thought that it was a good good episode. I've been enjoying the series. Uh, and, you know, we've talked about it several times. It's okay to be critical of things that you like, and it's okay to, to illustrate the things that, 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 that illustrate problematic stuff. But this one was really, uh, there was a lot of, I, I mean, all the problematic things were, I feel like the showrunners were trying to illustrate that they were problematic, you know, so. Uh, yeah. Pretty, well, pretty cool. I do think there was an issue that I know uh, Athena had brought up in uh, her notes uh, that I only might want to talk about more now with the the male gaze because that is something very noticeable. In mm. this. I actually completely overlooked it. Um, that was in Jack's notes. I had that in my oh. notes too. Yeah, in the very beginning, there's a she's all that moment. Whenever what's the what's the character's name? She she kind Aang. of uh, Aura. Aura. Yeah. Uh, no, not Cora. Katara. Katara, yeah. Well, Katara has the dress and everything like that. It's just like, I, you know, they, they go and say, you know, she. there's like this moment where the camera just sort of pans in. They do that full pan, yeah. Yeah, and it's yeah. just like yeah. uh, the, the little, the little uh, you know. How do I look? Uh, your mom's necklace. Oh. Oh, yeah. I 
guess it's pretty obviously water I, I wanted stuff. to give you credit for pointing that out because, like, I, um, I actually, um, this episode re was really easy for me to do because, um, I, me and Clay, my uh, partner, was recently went through the entire series. Mm. There's several times because since Aang likes Katara, that Katara is portrayed that way. Mm. And I just got so used to it that it didn't register with yeah. me. So I'm really glad you brought that up because yeah. um, it, it, it it's really good hedge me yeah. in the and, fact that it, like I just got used to it. And doubly so, too, yeah. that they use, they're, they're just supposed to be children, <laughs> you know, and they used all these yeah. she's, like techniques she's and She's 17 yeah. at yeah. that point. Uh, yeah. 14 when the series starts, but yeah, 16 at that point. And it's re really clearly uh, kind of sexualizing her there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it would. And that's the thing that always tripped me up. So I didn't watch the whole thing until, I guess, recently, like most of you as well. And I watched much of it with my children. Um, and, you know, there I've I, some of this is on purpose because I want to kind of like engage with this. As they get older, there's a oh man. Have you guys ever played Rayman Legends? Mm. Yes. Yeah, Rayman. Oh, yeah. Not Rayman Legends, the one before that. Oh shit! Uh, absolutely. Origins. The, and, yeah, the, the origins. And um, I just quick another quick aside. The fairies in Rayman Origins are all built like Meg the Stallion, mm. and and I'm like, wow. But then I'm like, oh, so let's talk about this. Yeah. Um, and you realize the kids don't know, you know, they, they're not noticing anything. So you try to explain, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Like most parents, <laughs> but the, the thing I wanted to get at is, um, they're so inconsistent with that over the course of the series. Mm -hmm. There's moments in the series where they're clearly explicitly children where Aang is tongue tied and doesn't know how to express his feelings and whatever else. And then there's like moments like this, where you have to think she's all that moment. And then at the end, suddenly Aang's this chat that's like, come down. Oh my God, me. yeah. And yeah. Like, it's just you and me here tonight. I'm like, yeah. dude, what are you doing? <laughs> I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I literally thought I, as I was watching the episode like earlier today, I was like, was Nickelodeon straight up like, they're like, we all know there's some children watching here that are having a sexual awakening right now and we're gonna completely just completely feed into that i mean well, i like yeah i don't know Aang. these shoes aren't really right for dancing and I, I i'm not sure that i know how to take my hand okay Aang, everyone's watching don't worry about them it's just you and me right now I, I will say, I don't have much an opinion on this because I'm ace, so, you know. Um, but uh, there is a lot of discussion um, I, I've seen about, like, wh what is okay to portray? Because, you know, kids are going to have crushes on each other and stuff. Mm, right. But how do you portray that? How much do you portray it? And I feel like I don't... I. I have a hard time having an opinion on this because um i didn't so yeah but i mean i think there's arguably some i mean and correct me if i'm wrong here but i there's probably some healthy amount of attraction to be shown among kids among each other yeah, in the media yeah. like i mean it's a thing that happens like it's you know i've oh, been there i i think completely i think that the distinction only needs to be made like i would hope that a show would and i think once again i think that Avatar does this pretty well in in outlining like healthy like a healthy relationship or like healthy boundaries or like or okay here's here's an example the bully character at school mm. who is hyper possessive over his girlfriend mm. and gets pissed when she talks to Aang yeah um yeah. and how the show is i believe clearly framing him as a horrible person yeah Obviously, then, he's, he's I, like, I like he's, we have, uh, he sells them out. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, he's I mean, he's a horrible person in every way, and the fact that he's like hyper hyper possessive over his his girlfriend is is just another like yeah. way to illustrate that that's like not a healthy. Uh, hi, Kuzan. I really like that crazy dance you were doing. Thanks, Anji. I can show it to you again if you'd like. Ah! What'd you say, Colony Trash? You're gonna show her something? Just some dance movements. Nobody shows my Anji anything, especially movement. So one thing I thought we haven't touched on yet is the dynamic between um, 
Fire Nation kid and an uncle and Iroh. Mm. Uh, Zuko. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zuko, I'm sorry, Zuko, Zuko and Iroh. Yeah. No, this is uh, uh, that's my role is to remember the names. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, but yeah, so I I thought that was interesting. Again, it's not humanizing fascism per se, but you know I talk a lot about empathy on the channel, and I always feel like we miss. It's very it, it within our own you know experiences under hegemony and just being human, we tend to want base enemies. That's the mm -hmm. easiest thing to rally behind. Mm -hmm. And so here's Zuko. What makes probably the Avatar so great is is the character Zuko in terms of like making it next level, who is in, in all his purposes a fascist for 85% of the show. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. But you recognize his fascism is steeped in his feelings of inadequacy, his desire to be loved by his parents, by his father, his, his loss of his mother. And then Zuko, who definitely has some war crimes on his hands, you know, <laughs> but we're, we're meant to sympathize and empathize with his situation. Um, and I don't know, I don't, I, the thing I love about it is it's challenging and I don't know where I stand. Um, and to me, that's good art. Yeah, that oh, is yeah. enough. Zuko well, is the best part of the whole show. It's in interesting opinion. that you bring that up, though, because then you have Azula. Um, and Azula, like, I always feel bad for Azula. Not in, in a weird pity way, because yeah. she is, she's a bad, she's crazy. No, she's crazy, and she needs to go down, as Iroh says. Um, but it's like, she's... It's also a product of her environment. Right, yeah. well, that's what I was, yeah, because she's obviously a villain, but she obviously has mental health problems. Um, she obviously has sociopathy and narcissism and, like, all of these really, these things. But, like, instead of, like, empathizing with her and, like, trying to work through these things, her uncle and her mother, who are the loving ones and whatnot, like, call, like treat her like a little monster. Like, she says, um, and this is spoilers, um, why are you listening to this if you don't want spoilers? Um, <laughs> but later, you know, she's, like, ranting at this, like, um, image of her mother in the mirror. And, like, you you never, you only like Zuko. You never loved me. You thought I was a mm. monster. And that pushed her further into um, the Fire Lord, Ozai. And he took advantage of, of, of this. Mm -hmm. Like, he, he, like, was like, okay, so we're going to take these, like, really bad tendencies and we're going to push you as far to the extreme of these things in a bad way that we can mm. get. And so then we see at the very end how that just all kind of crumbles and we you just le like just end up with this child mm. who is yeah. bound and just ranting and raving and fire like coming out everywhere while Zuko and Katara just look at her, you know, in kind of in dismay and it it's just it's just always something weird to me because like if you look online and stuff there are people like oh yeah fuck Azula and it's like it's just it's interesting to me that no one ever really has this take that mm. it's more complex she's con yeah, it's, yeah it's more complex <clears throat> yeah. yeah they have and it's, and they tried the show tried but that kind of speaks to us and our limitations because yeah. I remember the I feel like I went to sleep I watched this like going to bed <laughs> and I woke up like four episodes down in the Netflix hole. Uh, and, and it's the episode where they're having like a house party. And you oh see my god! Her yeah, trying to be normal, and it's so painful. Yeah, it her, is. Like, yeah, that's a that's a, a. I've definitely gone down the Netflix hole like that before a couple of times. <laughs> it happens. So yeah, I, I think that the series as a whole is is fantastic. I thought this episode was great. I thought that there's there's plenty of stuff for us to talk about, and and uh, you know I, I think that it 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 was a nice like package of everything. So. This whole, I wanted to plug this in and I didn't know where to. Um, there is an episode of The Dollop, episode 399, called The Third Wave. And if you want to see how quickly a school can be used to create little fascists, it is a very good episode. I love and the it dollop. is wild. It is, I, I would also suggest you guys listen, listen to this episode if you, if you haven't, because yeah. it is. I, I I remember listening to this and the entire time going, the fuck is happening? <laughs> right. 
Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that uh, I think that we'll definitely have a chance to do that. And um, but yeah, that, I think that's going to probably wrap it up for us. I want to give Feek a, an opportunity to talk about what he's working on and uh, you know how we can access it and what the what we should do to help support you. Yeah. Um, so uh, the YouTube channel is F dot D uh, signifier. And I'm not sure how I spelled it because I spelled it seven different ways across social media platforms. Let me look that up. We'll put a it's, link uh, in the description for sure. Link will be in the description. Um, and I do media analysis and video essays. And I don't know if you guys can hear the motorcycle just rolled past. So <laughs> I, I did. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I do video analysis and, and essays and media analysis and just critiques through a, a generally through a black lens. Um, I speak most explicitly about uh, black masculinity and black experiences of masculinity, but I touch and jump around as I find things that are interesting to talk about. And um, I am on Twitter and Instagram and YouTube. And uh, my next video is going to be my first sponsored video. Um, Fantastic. Oh, and, nice. Yes, yes. We're moving on up. It's uh, up. And it's cool. It's cool because I don't have to do raid uh, Shadow Legends, at least not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Who definitely did email me today, and I was like, I officially made it. <laughs> you made it I'm to in there now. I got the raid, raid Shadow Stalker. Legends tier of YouTube. <laughs> right, right. Um, it's actually for an um, organization that's doing uh, diversity training. And so I thought, oh, man, this is an awesome way there to kind of piggyback on the audience I've garnered yeah. in the yeah. last you know, couple of weeks. And so that video is going to be about allies and, and visions and images of allyship in the movies. And um, please be there. It'll probably be Friday uh, early evening. The is this even going to come out in time? I don't know what, what you guys just released. Yeah, yeah, on Friday. yeah. This will be on okay. Friday too. Yeah. So this will be next Friday. The whatever that day is after this Friday, because I can't okay. find the calendar. The tenth. The tenth. So God willing, next Friday the tenth, barring any setbacks, uh, that video will be out. And um, I yeah, can't that's wait. Pretty much it. I can't wait for it. I'll be there. I, if you're doing a live show, I'll be there. If not, I'll be there whenever it subs. I, I I love your content, and I think that it's fantastic work. I've been going through your backlog, so I'm I'm excited to see everything else comes out comes out. So thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate having had this. This is fun. Yeah, yeah, thank you for joining yeah. Us, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been it's been fantastic, and uh, so yeah, uh, we got a lot of really cool feedback from from Feek on on setting this up, setting up this format. I hope you like the new format. Please do give us some more feedback uh, as listeners. Uh, we you can find us on Twitter uh, at HedgePod. We're at uh, HedgePod at Gmail dot com. That's H E G E P O D at Gmail dot com. Um, Looking forward to uh, doing the next one and hearing from you. And if you'd like to be a guest also, uh, just reach out to us and let us know. Yeah, for sure. We'll, we're, we can uh, always take new perspectives, and uh, we, we're looking for somebody to balance our takes out and try to you know keep us keep us in check to make sure that we're not just going off on an echo chamber over here. You know. <laughs> so, and with that, we will catch you the next time. Bye. Bye. Peace and blessings, everybody.